our next speaker is uh, Professor Pietro Perona, Professor of Electrical Engineering at Caltech. Thank you, Pietro. So, hi, good afternoon, everybody. And <clears throat> this is one of those um, occasions in which I reminded how amazing my colleagues are and how happy I am I got out of the lab to listen to their work. And the other thing is how important is the support we get from, from the people in this room. And so I see many faces of people that have supported my work and work of my colleagues, and thank you very much. <clears throat> so my lab is, um, focuses on AI and computer vision in particular. And today I'll tell you about some projects we do on uh, helping ecologists and conservationists. So this is a beautiful planet. And one of the places I like to hang out at uh, during the summer is the Dolomites. Here you see a few of my friends and myself on a, on a hike. And um, one of the treats in late June, early July, is, uh, is the myriads of flowers you see. And um, you, on a hike like this, you take photographs and you find 20, 30 different species of flowers. And the magic is that a few days later, there is yet another set of flowers that are blooming. And so it's a continuous surprise. And um, this photo helps me make the point that <clears throat> they're beautiful, uh, they're there, and I never remember their name. I recognize them, but I don't remember their name, and so I, have, I cannot communicate to my friends what did they see on that particular day. And so this will be a theme in the talk. The second one is that season after season, the blooming uh, time seems to change, and this, uh, I think, uh, Steve Stock anticipated the whole message, which is, this is a glacier near um, where the photo was taken, this is Marmolada. And so when I was a boy, the glacier would come all the way down, and now it's all the way up. It's a big change, of course. And so the flowers bloom at a different time. The glaciers are retreating. And um, we know from um, measurements that insect populations, for example, are changing a lot. And in some places, what makes the big news is the decrease. And so up there, you see a plot of butterfly uh, populations in England, and so they seem to be going down a lot. In some other places, the populations go up. It's not that they are all going down, but definitely there is, there is a big change. And um, uh, I think where Steve was all about minerals um, and uh, electrons, I'm more about carbon uh, or you know, nature. And so something that really strikes me is uh, the statistics, which is <coughs> our, our footprint in terms of you know, what is the biomass of mammals on the planet. And so on the left, you have the estimate of how many gigatons of carbon biomass we had uh, 100,000 years ago. Now the carbon in uh, mammals is much higher, and why? And so we see that it's us and our animals. And so it's mostly cows, pigs, and sheep. And the, the thing is, the, the wild biomass of mammals is the tiny fraction down there. And so there are, of course, different estimates. But typically, you see a 90-10, 95-5 type uh, split. And when you look at numbers, um, there are maybe 400,000 wolves out in the wilderness, and there are 400 million pet dogs, and, and so on. So, the, um, and I want to um, put in a plug for my colleague Rob Phillips, who <coughs> likes to collect uh, all sorts of numbers about uh, human impact on the planet and explain them in approachable terms in these beautiful dioramas. And so here I've enlarged some of them. And so he, the, his units of measurements are swimming pools, soccer fields, containers, and so here is the uh, decrease of glaciers measured in volumes like containers. And so it's about four containers per person per year of loss of glaciers. And these are the, uh, the space taken by our animals and so on. So all of this to say that uh, we as humans, this species which we belong to, we are in charge. So it's clearly we've gone from a state in which we were sitting in the planet and being governed by the planet, and now we are instead on the, other, on the driver's seat. And so <clears throat> we need to take responsibility. And so um, I 
brainstorm with my students every now and then on what can we do. And so I think that there are a few things we can do. Um, so one is education, so helping the public understand what's going on. Uh, one is monitoring what is where and, uh, and tracking how things are changing. And so by what and where is where here, I mean species of animals and densities and so on. And, uh, and cause and effect, so we're very bad at understanding what causes what, and sometimes when we engage in conservation projects, the, the final effects are not the ones we were hoping for. And so to guide policy, we need to understand not only what is where, not only we need to be aware of change, but also what are the levers that we need to move in order to obtain certain results. And so today I want to discuss a couple of projects we engaged in, and I'll be happy. It's not all of our activity, but I picked a couple. And so to motivate the first one, I go back to the idea of the flowers. This is an email that one of my, that my father-in-law sent me a few years ago. He saw this mushroom and wanted to know if he should pick it up and eat it. And <laughs> I, so as a boy, I used to pick mushrooms uh, on the Alps. So if, if he knew that I knew. And when I saw it, I thought, by all means, you shouldn't, uh, <laughs> you shouldn't eat this one. <laughs> it's an Amanita panterina. I don't know how many of you know. And so my father-in-law, so this is, uh, you know, he knew that the information was somewhere, but it had no way to know which one, uh, how to do it, other than asking me. And so it was this social network uh, that if you are part of it, then you can find out things about the environment. But if you're not part of it, you, you have no, no clue. So how can we make this kind of information accessible to everyone, everywhere, at any time? Okay. And so this is the, the question that we asked, I asked myself about 10 years ago. And so, of course, what you want to do is all of us have these portable smart uh, devices. And so maybe take a photograph or listen to a sound and then tell what it is. And this is indeed um, what, uh, what we did about um, six years ago. And the hero is my student, Grant Van Horn. You see his photo in a, in a while. And so we have now a system uh, which is uh, co-developed with the California Academy of Science. It's called iNaturalist. You can download it to your smart device and you can use it to recognize uh, any one of 100,000 different species of plants and animals. So we hit 100,000 a month ago. And so here is a demonstration of what it does. And I want to, I, don't, I will not explain to you the details of how it happens. So it, you've heard about deep networks. You've seen a few examples this morning. So deep networks uh, for classifying photographs. And so this is a photograph I took. These are all photos I took. And you can see my feed. It's a social network. So if you go on iNaturalist, you will find me. And um, when you take a photograph like this, then the system will make recommendations. And the top recommendation is Chinook salmon. And so I chose that one and pushed it out. And there is a social network of um, people who may engage. And so uh, here are four people engaged. Uh, and so this Mac E agreed. So everybody said Chinook salmon. And so the system now knows that it's a Chinook salmon. There is a broad agreement on identification. And um, it will officially label this uh, Chinook salmon, and it becomes a research-grade picture. Now, this is a very important point, because where does the information come from? How do we know, or how does the system know how to classify these animals? Well, because there is a large training set. But who will annotate about 100 to 1,000 pictures for 100,000 um, 100, species to, to get this uh, information. Well, it's a crowd that is using the system. And how do we know that the crowd is right? Nobody knows who is right and who is wrong. And uh, the world is full of people who think that they know and they don't. And so the system has to figure out by itself whom to trust. And so there are two pieces of AI in this uh, iNaturalist. One is the classical piece of AI in which the system is trained to recognize plants and animals from photographs and assign a species to them. But in order to train it, it has to figure out who knows what. So it's classifying all the millions of people who interact with the system as to what they know about which one of the different genuses of nature that we deal with. And so here is um, an exemplification of that. I took this picture. And for some reason, this one was controversial. So 
I used the automated system and identified it as a cutthroat trout. And now you see that the system up there on the top right is classifying me as improving, which is a euphemism, as you might imagine. Um, and then someone else came in and classified it as rainbow trout, but the system classifies this person as maverick, which means very confused, not reliable at all, don't, don't even listen to them. And then other two people came in who had a higher reputation and thought that um, it was a cutthroat trout, and so now the system knows that it's a research-grade cutthroat trout. Okay? So this turns the table on classical AI where the presumption is that someone has a well-annotated training set, and then somebody like me comes along, we suggest an algorithm, and we transfer the training set into a model that we'll classify here. The machine cannot trust the source of information, and so the machine has to become a social animal, and it has to develop its own social network and decide who knows about butterflies, who knows about uh, cutthroat trouts, and so on. So here there are other examples. And I'll go very fast. I, so here I'm a maverick, so clearly not very good with the coleoptera. And um, uh, okay, this was uh, a surprise. I took this picture near Boston. I was taking a walk in the morning near Wellesley College, in fact. And, um, and so I was curious about who had taken down this tree and what kind of a tree it was. Why was it so valuable that somebody would come all the way into the woods to take down this particular tree, and it was near a pond. And, and so I took a picture thinking to tell me the species, and the species was a beaver. <laughs> <laughs> and so what you can see is that the system will learn from the pattern of usage, and more people label this kind of photograph as beaver than with a species of a tree, because that's the salient thing that uh, we want to know about the beaver. Okay. So this <coughs> system now, is, um, which we engaged in for fun, is now taking off thanks to the AI that we put into it. So before it was a bit of a, uh, a curiosity type uh, network. Here you see all the observations a couple of years ago. And so up to 2015, when we engaged, it was somewhat languishing. And then we put in computer vision and, um, and this um, <coughs> expertise rating. And as you can see, the number of observations per month is, um, is going up uh, to many millions. And um, about 300,000 species have been observed. I think maybe it's a bit old, maybe 400,000 species now. <clears throat> and our goal is to make it able to recognize about 500,000 species. I told you that we are about at about 100,000. And it's, so what's the difference? Well, because uh, we need to have enough training examples that have enough certainty on them to train the system, and it gets retrained every couple of months or so. Okay, so, so this is fun, and it achieves the first goal I was talking about, which is education. So now millions of people using the system, and the, the number is growing very fast, uh, are able to learn about their environment and to know what is, what is where, if they want to. Now the second question is, can we uh, get any science out of this? And so this is very difficult because the observations we have here have to do with people like me who want to go out for a hike, and at some point they feel a bit sweaty, they stop, oh, and they see a wonderful flower, let me take this picture, oh, it's an Edelweiss, but maybe next to the Edelweiss there was a lizard. I didn't take a picture of the lizard, God knows what else was there. And so I only have spot measurements of a few things that are there, and I don't know what other things are there, and I don't know what was not there. So I don't have any negative measurements. So only positive measurements and only delta function type measurements taken in a very Poissonian way. Uh, what can I learn about the world? This is all junk. How, how can I make use of it? But here enters another student, Eli Cole, and postdoc, uh, Oshin McKay. And they convinced me that, uh, in fact, you can tell a lot. Um, and they came up with a very clever statistical algorithm, which I'm not going to <laughs> take you through, which is able to make use of the correlations between all the different species 
in order to bridge across all the gaps that are there in the measurements that we take. Okay, and so, so there are some species that are highly correlated and there are some patterns in the movement of people who take these uh, measurements. And by combining this information with these delta function type measurements, you can estimate the range of, uh, of species. Okay, and so this has made it into, so the paper is just now, now being reviewed, ACML, sorry, it came out this year, and, uh, and the iNaturally team was able to integrate it all, and now they are announcing um, that uh, you will be able to use it, and so this is the demonstration for two species. These are the sort of uh, spot-like measurements that we get for their presence, and now using Eli's and Oshin's model, we can get uh, an accurate estimate of the range of distribution, and we can even get at the density, the predicted, we can predict the density for these species uh, where they are. And so here we can start doing science because uh, we can track what is the uh, change in time and what is the distribution, what are patterns of migration, and all, all of that. And we can even, even uh, spot the most unusual measurements, so the ones that are very fringe or unexpected given the estimated range, and this may have some value for, for ecologists. Um, okay, I want to put a plug for another app, which is Merlin Bird ID, and I know that some of you are, are fans of this one. This one will recognize specifically birds from their picture, and now we're almost at 10,000 species, and, um, and birds from their songs, and it's a lot of fun to sit in your backyard or out in nature and open the app, let it run, and it will tell you which birds are singing at any given time. It's really um, eye-opening or ear, I don't know what to say, the metaphor would be, but it's really amazing to, to use it. Okay, so what are the challenges we face and that we are trying to solve? And so it turns out that uh, nature is a long tail distribution, and uh, if you sort the species by abundance, the count is decreasing very fast, and so there's a log-log scale. Straight line means long tail distribution. And so for most species, like 90%, we have very few uh, training examples, and uh, current AI methods are very data hungry. Um, and so humans can learn from maybe 10 pictures, five pictures, uh, but, uh, but our machines need 100 to 1,000. And um, in order to develop these methods, um, we need to, or in order to deploy these methods, um, we need to become better with our machines at learning from very few training examples. It's something that the whole field is working on. Uh, let me skip this one. Okay, the second <coughs> project I want to talk about uh, has to do with fish. And um, it's, um, uh, this is another plot of change. And so it goes from more or less when I was born to now. And until halfway through my life, the fish we ate was fished in the oceans. And aquaculture started around 1990. And as you can see, the catch in the ocean remained, remains constant, while aquaculture is supplying now more than half of the, of the seafood that we consume as a species. Now, that... Um, uh, constant capture curve uh, is comforting, namely we're, maybe we are not depleting the oceans, but what's happening is that in fact it's based on uh, how many unstable fisheries that we don't uh, uh, take care of and that are being uh, wiped out. And so that's uh, not a, a good story. And, um, and one of the paradigmatic stories is the story of, of cod catches um, in, uh, in the northeast, between Canada and the US. And what you see that happened was that uh, catches kept going up and up and up. And at some point, an event happened, which I'm not telling you what, but it was a, a dramatic event, where it became a free for all. People didn't respect their quotas, went out, and basically they wiped out completely the cod fishery in the northeastern uh, Atlantic, okay, on the, on the Grand Banks. So, so how do we, uh, deal with this kind of thing? Well, it turns out that a crucial aspect is being able to give uh, reliable numbers on what's abundance of a species of fish. Okay? 
All international treaties have to be based on quantitative assessments because they have to establish quotas for fishing. And if people don't trust the official quotas, they think they are too high or too low, then all bets are off. And, um, and so how do you count all the fish? And so I don't know how to do it, but if we found a species in which we can do it, and it's a species that is extremely um, uh, important to the Pacific Northwest, and it's salmon. And here we can count them because they come uh, to spawn into the rivers uh, of the Pacific Northwest, and every year there is a great migration. And the hope is to be able to uh, count them as they go upstream to reproduce. And so the main Napoleonic goal is to count every single salmon that goes to reproduce in the Pacific Northwest, and then in the long term, Siberia and Scotland, Norway, etc. So how, how can that be done? Um, and so there are many rivers, and uh, many of these rivers, um, the different fish and game departments and the tribal uh, agencies are installing um, uh, devices like the one you see there. They're shoebox sized and they're sonars that can see the fish in a fairly grainy way as they go by, and this is an example. Um, and so, so that's a close-up image, but uh, really the signal we get is like here on the left. And um, the, currently these counts are done by hand, and since they're done by hand, nobody's actually counting the fish. So there is signal, but uh, nobody knows how to use it. And so this is sitting there. And this is useful in two ways. One is uh, fishery management. And so as you know, Alaska, as a state that in part, the economy in part depends on, on commercial catching of salmon, so they need to count them in order to say when the uh, fishing can start in the commercial fishing. But the other states want to know about conservation, and so let me skip, skip, skip. Um, it's, um, and so we are building um, a computer vision system that uh, is able to detect and track the fish, as you can see here, and count them. And this is quite successful. So here on the x-axis, we have ground truth counts in many different locations, many different weeks. And um, on the vertical axis, ground truth counts. And you can see that we can get within 10% or so of, of the ground truth. And uh, the challenge now that we are working on is how to build a system that will count fish in uh, new rivers, because this good quality prediction is only possible if we have trained the system in the same river, in the same location, where uh, we're going to use it. And this is not, uh, not scalable. And so the big question is, how do we do it? OK. So maybe last thing, we have started an initiative in the second year now for teaching ecologists about uh, computer vision methods, because we, we cannot scale as a, as a team, we cannot service everybody with all the interesting cases that they bring to us. And so we thought we would have a summer school where we teach these ecologists uh, how to use our methods. And it's three weeks in August every summer. And there is a whole teaching team. And these are projects that the students are, uh, are carrying out. And um, I don't have the time to describe them. but. If you can read, um, you see some titles that are quite interesting. OK, so I told you what we are doing for general public education. And uh, how are we working towards understanding what is where on a global scale, how many of each species there are. And of course, um, we will hopefully be able to track change over time as our measurements accumulate. And cause and effect is still way uh, ahead of us, but not, not there yet. Thank you.
Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the system which is uh, like classifying species, different species, is uh, classifying people as well, whether they're expert or not. So for that, is it looking at profile of the people or because uh, maybe if, uh, some person is expert in different type of like birds, but not expert in different type of like other animals. So how is yeah. it decided? Yeah, okay. So it's, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so uh, there is a, let's call it a confusion matrix for each person and for each genus, we estimate how good is that person at telling us, inform giving us information about that genus. So there may be an amazing butterfly lady somewhere who doesn't know anything about seals or somebody who knows about dolphins and knows about uh, coleoptera and so on. So we know quite in detail what every person knows. At least we have some error bars on their knowledge. Uh, and that helps the system uh, estimate how safe is uh, a certain guess about a certain species. And so when there are five or six people who have high, high status and each one of them co convenes that that's the species, then the system trusts it and uh, moves on and says, okay, this is my training example now. <laughs> no, we don't trust the people to tell us. Uh, but one thing we measure, so I didn't mention it, is so we, we've realized that people are extremely gregarious and since the way the app is designed, it shows you what other people said before you express your judgment on a species. We figure there are some people who may know a lot, but they tend to agree with whoever came before them. And so that pollutes their judgment. And so there is a term in our statistical estimation package, which also estimates how much of a maverick are you or how much of a sheep are you? Are you tending to side with anybody who came before you? What are you going to do? Are you a contrarian? And that can be estimated too.